Good morning, Saddleback. I want to say hi to all of our campuses across Southern California, and I want to say hi to actually our campuses now starting all around the world on all seven continents, and for those of you who are joining us online. Now this weekend, we're starting a new series called You Make Me Crazy. Don't look at them. You know, just think about them in your mind. And if you'll take out your message notes and turn to the book of James, the book of James, chapter three. Now this series on relational health, you make me crazy. We're gonna look at the crazy makers in your life that just irritate you and how to deal with those people. It's part of our series that we're doing in Decade of Destiny. During Decade of Destiny, we're looking at the seven key areas of your life. Financial health, relational health, spiritual health, mental health, emotional health, vocational health, physical health. We're looking at every, every area of getting healthy in your life. Now you remember we started uh, a year and a half ago with the first module on, we actually started with physical health. And we launched the Daniel Plan on which you have now uh, gotten a whole lot healthier. In fact, our church has lost over 280,000 pounds. In fact, this week, Time Magazine, seven pages on the Daniel plan. And this week in Time Magazine. So you might look in there, there's some pictures of members, uh, healthy people, wow. And, uh, and, and I know you're gonna wanna frame this one. Let me find it here, because this is, this is a, this is, a, in fact, I'll autograph it for you, okay? It's a, okay, okay, let me see if I can find it here. There we go. You need this picture. Okay, all right, all right, you need this picture. Uh, anyway, also this week, uh, CNN did a major article on the Daniel Plan. Newsmax Magazine did a major spread on the Daniel Plan. So we started with the physical health, getting physically healthy. And then we went to financial health because we've been in the middle of a recession now for almost five years. And then earlier this year, we looked at spiritual health and 40 days in the Word and how do you feed yourself from the Word of God so you're growing stronger and stronger every day. And now this summer, we're going into a, a series where we're gonna look at relational health. Now, there was a pastor this last week who will remain unnamed to protect the guilty. And uh, he went over to visit an elderly woman in our church uh, she, uh, uh, she had lost her husband a number of years ago. She's in her 80s, and he went over to just pay her a visit, and he, was, he sat there in her living room. It was right around lunchtime, and he was kind of hungry, and she had a big bowl of peanuts, and as they talked, he ate one, and of course, you can't eat just one, and he started eating more and more, and when they finally finished, he realized he'd eaten the entire bowl of peanuts. <laughs> he felt a little uh, embarrassed by it, and he said to this elderly woman, she, he said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I've eaten all your peanuts. And she said, oh, don't worry, Pastor. She said, I can't chew on them after I've sucked the, uh, the chocolate off. <laughs> he said, you know, I felt a little foolish. <laughs> now, we all do foolish things from time to time. Usually unintentionally, sometimes intentionally. You'd have a lot fewer problems if you were less foolish and more wise. Wisdom doesn't get rid of your problems, but wisdom definitely minimizes your problems. If you know how to respond wisely to situations, your problems will be dramatically reduced in your life. It's all about wisdom, knowing how to handle things and uh, not be foolish. Now, nowhere are we more foolish than in our relationships. We foolishly treat people uh, in ways that are really counterproductive. In fact, a lot of times we provoke people to do the very behavior we don't want. We foolishly think, this is how I'm gonna get what I need out of this relationship. More fulfillment, more intimacy, more joy, more satisfaction, uh, more uh, stability. I need my relationships to be fulfilling, not draining. But actually, the things you do are often counterproductive. They are foolish. They are not wise. Because if you do what you naturally feel like doing in a relationship, it's almost always the wrong thing. As I said, wisdom doesn't eliminate problems, but it, it definitely does reduce them. Now, the classic passage 
on wisdom and relationships is in the book of James, chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. Let me read it to you. It's there on your outline. It's here on the screen. The Bible says this. If you are wise and you understand God's ways, you'll live a life of steady goodness so that only good deeds pour forth. And if you don't brag about the good you do, then you will be truly wise. But if you are bitterly jealous and there's selfish ambition in your heart, don't brag about being wise. That's the worst kind of lie. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly and unspiritual and motivated by the devil. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder. Now let me just stop right there. You got any chaos in your life? Got any disorder in your life? Got any area of your life that's confused? The Bible says wherever you find confusion, wherever you find disharmony, wherever you find disorder, there's ego. There's ego. Whether it's in the office or at home or at school. He says wherever you find jealousy and selfish ambition, you'll find disorder and every kind of evil. Now wisdom, the kind of wisdom that comes from heaven, is first of all pure, it's also peace-loving, gentle at all times, willing to yield to others. It's full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no partiality, and it's always sincere. Now, those who are peacemakers, he's talking about in relationships, those who are peacemakers plant seeds of peace, and they reap a harvest of goodness. Now, these verses teach us a whole lot about relationships that you're not going to learn anywhere else in life. First, the Bible teaches us that wisdom is a way of relating. It has to do with what you do, not what you think. A lot of people think wisdom is intelligence. Wisdom is smarts. Wisdom is education. No, 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 no. The world is full of educated fools. The Bible says that wisdom shows up primarily in your relationships. You may have all kinds of knowledge and still be a fool. You may have all kinds of education, so many degrees they call you Dr. Fahrenheit. <laughs> but you'd still be foolish. You can have all kinds of brilliance and be technically smart. But wisdom shows up in relationships. That's why you can take a brilliant scientist whose family life is a mess. He may be smart, but he's not wise. Wisdom always has to do with relationships. And it shows up in how you treat other people. In other words, it's about your life, not your lips. It's about what you do, not what you say. It's not about your diploma. It's about your disposition. And in verse 14 to 16, it says, you know the way we typically relate to people? He said those ways are foolish. When we get bitter, when we get angry, when we get resentful, uh, when we get jealous, when we get selfish and ambitious, in relationships. He goes, all those are foolish ways that don't get you what you want and what you need out of the relationship. In verse 18, it says, those who, plant, those who are peacemakers plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of goodness. Every day, in every relationship, you are planting seeds. I'll say it again. Every day, in every relationship, you are planting seeds and you're gonna reap what you sow. Now you're planting either seeds of trust or distrust. You're planting seeds of anger or peace. You're planting seeds of love or harmony. You're planting seeds in every relationship in your life every single day. The question is what kinds of seeds? How do I plant seeds of peace? And the answer is I gotta be wise. I've got to be wise. I've got to do it the wise way. Now what we're gonna do today is we're gonna look at this passage because it teaches us the six things that wise people never do in relationships. And I've done every one of them. And so have you. And they are foolish approaches to your relationships. Your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, your friends, your boss, your employees. Your, uh, the neighbors, these are six things that wise people never do. And in verse 17, James gives us a checklist. These are the foundations of healthy relationships. Now in 
the future series, uh, uh, weeks, we're gonna look at the crazy makers in your life, how to diffuse, deflect, and defend yourself against the crazy makers. But in any relationship, half the problem is you. It's how you respond. And when you respond incorrectly to the crazy makers in your life, you actually make it worse. So let's get right into it. Foundations of healthy relationships. Six things wise people will never do in relationships. Number one, first the Bible says that wisdom, if I wanna be wise, wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. Now circle that word pure. What's he mean by this word pure? It means uncorrupted, clean, unpolluted, clear, untainted. What's he talking about? The word we use today is the word integrity. He's talking about integrity. And he's saying the foundation of all good relationships is integrity. Now why is integrity listed first? Because wisdom starts in the heart, not in the head. And the reason integrity is listed first is this. All relationships are built on trust. No trust, no relationship. And all trust is built on truth. If you don't have truth, you don't have trust. If you don't have trust, you don't have a relationship. If a guy's lying to his wife all the time, he may have an arrangement, but he doesn't have a relationship. He may have a commitment, but he doesn't have a relationship. Because relationships are built on truth. Because truth is the foundation of trust. Honesty is the bedrock of all relationships. You gotta be honest, you gotta shoot straight with people. If, if, if you're just lying to the people in your life, you don't have a relationship. You've probably never heard of Leonard Keeler, but Leonard Keeler's a pretty famous guy. Dr. Leonard Keeler invented the lie detector. And during his lifetime, he tested over 25,000 people on the lie detector. He wrote a book about it. His conclusion, we all lie. Well, duh. <laughs> he says human beings are fundamentally and by nature dishonest. You lie to God, you lie to other people, and you lie to yourself all the time. In fact, you lie to you more than anybody else. We have the amazing ability to tell ourselves things that aren't true and convince ourselves that they are. You lie to yourself all the time. The Bible says the heart is deceitful. That means we have an amazing ability to con ourselves. We think things are right when they're not. And we think things are not right when they are. And so he says you gotta start with integrity. The Bible says in Ephesians, look up here on the screen, Ephesians 4.25, you must stop telling lies. Tell each other the truth, because we all belong to each other in the same body. Now here is the first mark of wisdom. If you want your relationships to get better this summer, number one is this. If I want to be wise in my relationships, I won't compromise my integrity. I won't compromise my integrity. I won't violate my conscience. I won't compromise my convictions. I won't live a double life. I won't lie to you, I'll tell you the truth because trust is built on truth. No truth, no trust, no trust, no relationship. Proverbs two verse seven says this, there on your outline. God grants a treasure of good sense, and by the way, that's what you need in relationships. You need a treasury of good sense. God grants a treasure of good sense to the godly. He is their shield protecting those who walk with integrity. You need a shield in your life against the crazy makers. There are people who try to mess up your life all the time. And God says, I will be a shield in your life. You need a shield against the crazy makers. But he says, you gotta walk with integrity if you're gonna have my shield in your life. So first, wisdom is pure, and if I wanna be wise in my relationships, I won't compromise my integrity. Number two, wisdom is peace-loving. That's the second thing it says. In other words, wise people are peacemakers, they're not troublemakers. Wise people don't carry a chip on, chip on their shoulder. Wise people are not always looking for a fight. Do you love a good fight? Then you're not wise. The Bible says wisdom is peace loving. Fools love to fight. Just go on the internet, it's full of them. Just look up any blog. 
Foolish people love to fight. They love to argue. They love to mix it up with people. Some people get into politics just because they love the fight. That's not smart. It's dumb. It's foolish. The Bible says wisdom is peace-loving. It's not always trying to provoke anger. So here's the, the second thing. If I want to be wise in my relationships, I won't antagonize your anger. I won't antagonize your anger. In other words, I don't push your hot buttons intentionally. I don't provoke your rage. I don't egg you on. Now, the fact is, if you've been around anybody for any length of time, you pretty soon figure out what irritates them. And you file that back in the back of your mind as tool to use when we get in an argument. It's a weapon of mass destruction. And you know what pushes their button. And you know what just ticks them off. And when you get in an argument and they say something that hurts you, offends you, or slights you in any way, then you pull out the big gun, you use the weapon of mass destruction, you push their hot button and you go, and they go, and you go, works every, works every time. You know what the Bible calls that? Stupid. You're not getting any closer to the resolution. You're not helping the relationship. In fact, you're hurting it. It is not wise. If I'm wise, I don't antagonize your anger. I don't use weapons of mass destruction that I know are gonna tick you off. I don't push your buttons even when I know what your buttons are and even when you've already pushed mine, I'm gonna be the wiser person and I'm not gonna push back. Proverbs 20 verse three says this. Any fool can start an argument. Any fool can start arguments. The wise thing is to stay out of them. So don't be baited by internet trolls who, you know, they'll say something off the wall and then you get stuck arguing with them online. You don't even care about these people. He says, don't, don't get baited. Don't, don't get baited and don't antagonize people's anger. Now, during this series, we're gonna have some fun because we're gonna laugh at ourselves because we all use tools, tricks of the trade, skills in relationships that are actually counterproductive. They're hurtful, they're harmful, and they don't get you what you want out of a relationship. In fact, they get you the exact opposite behavior. But when we lack wisdom, we use them anyway. Now there are lots of these. We're gonna look at them in the weeks ahead. Let me just mention three of them today. Uh, tools that you should never use because these always antagonize other people's anger. If you're wise, you're never going to do these things anymore with people in relationships. Number one is comparing. You may write that one down, comparing. You're going to antagonize somebody's anger when you start comparing them to anybody else. It always makes them mad. Why can't you be like so-and-so? or you're always like so-and-so, or you're just like your mother. Oh, that's very helpful, <laughs> okay? You can guess the predictable response to that one. You're just like your mother. Oh, thank you, or you're just like your dad. Second Corinthians 10, 12 says, anybody who compares is a fool. It's foolish, it's not wise. Never compare your wife, your husband, your kids, your yard, your boss, or anybody else because everybody's unique. Comparing antagonizes anger. Condemning antagonizes anger. Don't do it. When you start laying on the guilt in a relationship, you start trying to make people feel guilty for what they've done, you start trying to make them feel ashamed, you should be ashamed. All you're gonna do is get the exact opposite of what you expect. It doesn't work, it's foolish. Ladies, let me explain something to you. Every man is fighting his conscience all the time. Whether he realizes it or not, he may not even realize it, but every man is constantly fighting his conscience. When you decide to be a man's conscience, guess who he gets angry at? He takes all that anger he's fighting against himself and his own conscience and his own ethics and he just turns it on you. Is that what you want? No, no, you don't want that. So that's a foolish thing to do. Don't try to be somebody else's God. Don't try to be somebody else's conscience. You should, you must, you ought, you need to, you always, you never. Anytime you use those words, dumb. 
Because all you're going to do is you're going to take that guy who's fighting his own conscience and all of a sudden he starts fighting you because you represent his conscience. It doesn't work. Comparing and, and, and uh, condemning. And number three, contradicting. Always makes people mad. You ever watched a spouse correct every detail of a story while the other person's telling it? It's irritating. Anybody want to give a testimony? Okay, it's irritating. It, if I'm wise, I won't antagonize your anger. If you're wise, you don't sweat the small stuff. Okay, you just don't sweat it. You don't sweat the small stuff. You don't get hooked into it. William James, a famous psychologist, said, wisdom is the art of knowing what to overlook. And there's some stuff you just need to overlook. And you're not trying to make a big deal of that. You're not contradicting. Proverbs 14, 29 says this. A wise man controls his temper. He knows that anger causes mistakes. Have, have you ever said or done anything stupid out of anger? Yes. Because when you get angry, your, your intelligence goes out the window. When you get angry, you say and do stupid things that are actually self-defeating. Did you know there's only one letter difference between anger and danger? When you get angry, you are in dangerous territory. You are about to hurt yourself with your own anger. The Bible says, wise man controls his temper, he knows that anger causes mistakes. So, if I'm wise, I don't compromise my integrity and I don't antagonize your anger. Number three. The third thing the Bible says, wisdom is gentle all the time. It's gentle all the time. It is courteous, the Bible says in the Living Bible. The NIV translates it considerate. If I'm wise, I'm always gonna be considerate. Look it up here on the screen. Philippians 4, 5 says this in the Bible. Let everyone see that you are considerate in most of everything you do. Oh, it didn't say that. It says, let everybody see that you are considerate in what? All you do. I don't like that word. I looked it up in the original Greek. It means all. <laughs> Wait a minute. You mean I have to be considerate when people are inconsiderate to me? Yes. I have to be considerate to clerks who are jerks? Yes. When people are rude to me, I don't get to be rude back? No, not if I'm smart. If I'm foolish, I can get back. But if I wanna be wise, if I wanna have wisdom, I am always, always, always considerate. I am not allowed to call you names. I am not allowed to be rude to you. I'm not allowed to slur you back. I'm not allowed to get even because that puts me on the same level as you. I am always to be considerate. Now, this is so important. Wise people are considerate even when people are blasting away at them. Why? Because being considerate is the antidote to the two most common mistakes, foolish mistakes, that you make in relationships. The two most common mistakes that you make in relationships. And the first mistake you make is we react to what people say and ignore how people feel. Dumb. We pay too much attention to their words and not enough attention to their emotions. The words don't really matter. People say stuff when they're angry they don't even mean. They use words they don't even intend to use. They exaggerate things. But you need to look behind the words and look at the emotion because that's what it is. People don't always say what they mean, but they always feel what they feel. And so if you are wise in a relationship, you stop focusing on what your kids or your boyfriend or your husband or your wife or your boss says that just ticks you off and you start looking behind and go, what are they, what's the emotion they're feeling there and why are they feeling that emotion? That's what wise people do. You see, being considerate means simply mindful of the feelings of others. To be considerate means mindful of the feelings of others. Not the words, but the feelings. And if I'm considerate, even when you blast me, I look beyond and I go, well, now what would cause them to feel that way? And I, I just let the words roll right past me and I go, what would cause them to be that uptight, that irritated, that rude? Hurt people always hurt people. 
Unkind people are those who need your kindness the most. They need massive doses of kindness. When people are rude and unkind, they are screaming to the world, I'm in pain. People who are not in pain are, are kind. People who are always in pain are unkind and rude. Hurt people hurt people. So you look beyond the words and you look at the, the, the feelings. Romans 15, two says this, here on the screen. We must be considerate, that means mindful of the feelings of others, of the doubts, everybody's got doubts, and the fears, everybody's got fears, of others. Let's please the other person, not ourselves, in doing what's good for him and build him up. We react to what people say and ignore what they're feeling. Big mistake. The other mistake we do is we invalidate any feelings that we don't feel ourselves. I don't feel it, so you shouldn't. If I don't feel what you feel, then your feeling is dumb, it's irrational, it's illogical, it makes no sense, and you shouldn't feel it. And we just dismiss it because we don't feel it, then you shouldn't feel it. That's foolish. That is not wise. You ever played this game? It's cold in here. No, it's not. <laughs> yes, it's cold in here. No, it's not. I'm cold. No, you're not. Actually, it's quite warm. In fact, I'm burning up in here. No, you're not. And you start arguing over, you know, all kinds of stuff. You know, it's just a feeling. It's not a fact. It's just a feeling. You can argue over facts, this is a feeling. Can somebody be cold and somebody else be warm at the same time? Yes, yes. So why are you arguing about it? Whoever invented the dual control electric blanket should be given the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> it saved millions of marriages. Now if they can just figure out how to do the air conditioning in the car and a little thing right in the middle. You, when we invalidate other people's feelings because we don't feel it, we minimize that person. Guys, if your girlfriend or your wife says to you, I feel ugly, you don't dismiss it. You're not ugly. That doesn't help at all. You, what you need to do is say, why would you feel that? What would make you say that? because you need to look beyond the feeling, I mean, I mean the, the words, and say, why would she say, I'm a, she's obviously not ugly. But for you to just say, you're not ugly, that's not helpful, that's not helpful. When they says, I feel ugly, you need to go, why would you say that? What's making you feel that today? Now you're getting to the real issue. Somebody says, I'm afraid, well don't be. Oh thank you, that was very helpful. I really felt your moral support right there just then. I was, you know, I'm scared to death and you say, don't. <laughs> Thank you very much. That is minimizing. Now, if you don't get anything else I say, get this today. Feelings are neither right nor wrong. They're just there. Feelings are neither right no wrong, they're just there. They're not facts, so you don't need to argue it. They're just feelings. And if I feel something, I shouldn't have to defend it. And if you feel something, you shouldn't have to defend it. Somebody should just go, I hear you. And maybe other people feel that way too. What we do is we try to convince people that their feelings are wrong and you're always gonna lose at that one. Number three. If I want to be wise, I won't minimize your feelings. I don't compromise my integrity. I don't antagonize your anger, push your hot buttons, and I don't minimize your feelings. Wisdom acknowledges your feelings and doesn't diminish them. You see, the typical reaction, when we don't feel what other people feel, we do two things. Number one, we belittle them. If you had a brain, you would know that's just not true. And you wouldn't feel that way. We belittle, that doesn't help. And the other thing, this is worse, is we play psychologist. Now the reason you feel this way is because your father, oh. <laughs> okay, all right. You know, you are not a psychologist and you, you are condescending when you try to tell people why they feel the way 
they feel. You don't even know why you feel the way you feel. You can't figure out your own motives half the time. Why would you think you could figure out somebody else's? The moment you start judging somebody else's motives, you're playing God and you're wrong. That's a battle you're gonna lose. Don't play psychologist. Proverbs 15, four says this in the Bible. Kind words bring life, but cruel words crush your spirit. You ever come home from a day at work and play the game, my day was worse than your day? <laughs> well, I had this problem, and, you know, and you know, your husband or your wife or your roommate tells you all the bad things, and instead of you sympathizing, empathizing, and being considerate, you say, you think you had problems. <laughs> no, no, those are minor. Let me tell you what a real problem is. And you start telling your problem. Is that actually helping the relationship? No, it's foolish, it's dumb, it's not wise. The Bible says wisdom is gentle, wisdom is considerate. Is it possible you both had a tough day? Yes. Is it possible that you could be considerate of their tough day without having to top it? Yes. What am I saying? I'm saying if you wanna be wise, if you wanna stop making the same stupid relational mistakes over and over and over, you need to stop minimizing other people's feelings. You need to let your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your spouse, your parents, your children, whoever, you need to let them feel what they feel without minimizing it. You need to let them feel tired when they're tired and not try to talk them out of it. You need to let them feel depressed when they're depressed and not try to talk them out of it. You need to let them feel angry or alone or scared when they feel that way. Friends offer kind words, not remedies. The other day Kay was being interviewed and they asked her, they said, do you wake up grumpy in the morning? She said, no, I usually let him sleep. <laughs> she, she's considerate. She's, she's considerate. She lets me sleep in. Some days I don't believe in God before 11 a.m. <laughs> Number four, wisdom is willing to yield to others. Pastor Tom is gonna come and teach us on this fourth mark of wisdom. It's open to reason. It allows discuss, discussion. This Greek word, eupathos, it's the only time in the whole Bible this word is used. And it's a great word for wisdom in relationships. It means you're not stubborn. You're not defensive. Now, how do you know that? How do you know if you have this kind of quality in your life? One of the main ways you know is how you listen. That's one of the main ways that you see this willingness to yield to others. The wiser you are, the better a listener you will be. And the more foolish you are, the less you will listen to others. I've got to admit, I do a very unwise thing all the time in relationships. It's totally unwise. I tend to finish people's sentences for them. Anybody else do this? You know, they're saying something and I, I wanna move the conversation along. So I like say the end of the sentence. That's very unwise, because I'm not letting them say what they wanna say, and I may not hear really what I need to hear in that. So if you're wise, it, you realize it's foolish to cut people off. It's foolish to not let people have their say. It's foolish to jump to conclusions. So instead of that, you wanna be, you wanna be open to reason. You wanna be willing to listen. You wanna be willing to learn. Now, if I asked you, are you a reasonable person? I think most of us would say, yes, I'm reasonable. Let me ask you, how do you know you're reasonable? Because think about this, if you were unreasonable, you wouldn't know you were unreasonable because you were unreasonable. So how do you know if you're really a reasonable person? One of the ways that you know is, do you listen to others? Let me tell you one of the main ways you know if you're a reasonable person. Can people you disagree with reason with you? If you have people in your life, you disagree with them, but they can reason with you, you can talk through it, that's one of the ways that you know that you're a reasonable person. But a lot of us, we, we have this attitude, don't confuse me with the facts. My mind is made up. When I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. We have this kind of an attitude. And so because of that, we're not wise in relationships. And because of that, we all struggle with this. We have, we have this oversensitivity when it comes to talking to other people with other people's suggestions. Because it, it's tough, let's just admit it. It is tough to hear the suggestions of other people. You have to put yourself out there. Like that new pastor who said to his church, first sermon he was preaching, and he said, you know, I really want, I really want 
your honest suggestions afterwards. So after the message, he was talking to one of the men in the church, and he said, okay, give me your honest suggestions. And the guy said, well, honestly, pastor, that sermon stunk. And the guy looked at him and said, he was trying to be reasonable, and he said, well, okay, what, what exactly stunk about it? He really wanted to hear. And he said, well, there were three things that stunk about it. First, you read it. Second, you read it poorly. And third, it wasn't worth reading in the first place. <laughs> Now, the next guy that came to talk to the pastor was trying to encourage him and said, don't worry about old Jim. He just repeats what everybody else says. So don't, don't, worry, about, don't worry about that at all. <laughs> the tough thing about listening to other people and hearing their suggestions is you got to put yourself out there. And it can hurt sometimes. But if you're going to be wise, in fact, write this in with me. If I want to be wise, I won't criticize your suggestions. I won't criticize your suggestions. A wise person can learn from anybody. Listen, even a broken clock is right twice a day. So people in your life, they're gonna be right. And let me tell you something God does in my life and he's gonna do in your life to totally humble you when it comes to listening to other people's suggestions. There are gonna be people in your life, the most irritating people in your life, the you drive me crazy kind of people we're talking about, sometimes they're gonna have a good suggestion. That person in your family, that they're wrong about everything else, they're gonna be right about something. That person at your office, that person at your school, it's the worst thing in the world when the very person you, that's driving you crazy has a good suggestion for your life. But let me ask you, can you learn from them? Can you learn from anybody? Look at this next verse in the outline, Proverbs 18, 15. Intelligent people are always open to new ideas. In fact, they look for them. Anywhere and everywhere, you look for these new ideas. Now, what if, what if people have a stupid idea? Well, you do the same thing with their stupid idea that you do with your stupid ideas. If it's a good idea, you listen to it and you learn. If it's a stupid idea, then you ignore it and you forget it. Stop wasting your life trying to prove a stupid idea right or wrong. Just move on to the next good idea. If I'm wise, I'm open to suggestions. I won't criticize your suggestions. You know, I have spent much of my life hanging out with people I totally disagree with so I could share the love of Jesus with them and help them come to know Christ, which means I've heard a lot of stupid ideas. I've sat in groups of people who share me stuff that's the most off the wall, crazy idea. What do you do? You just smile and you nod <laughs> and you don't interrupt and you let them say their entire piece. Because what I've learned is if you let people say their entire piece, they'll let you say your entire piece. And then I can come back and say, well, here's what I think. Here's what I believe. Here's what the Bible says. And people go, oh, well, that makes sense. I never thought about it that way. But if you try to interrupt them in advance, you try to take them down point by point, you are being a fool. It is foolish to try to take people down point by point. You just make them mad. As Tom said, you just gotta listen. You gotta be open to reason. Now number five, the Bible says wisdom is full of mercy and good deeds. Circle that word mercy. If I'm gonna be wise, I'm gonna maximize mercy. I'm gonna major on mercy in my relationships. Full of mercy and good deeds. In other words, it's wise to show grace to people when they mess up, when they blow it, when they sin, when they fumble, when they flub up, when they have faults. When they fail, it's wise to show mercy when people show up. It's wise to cut people slack when they mess up. Let me, let's just take it this way. Who is the wisest person in the universe? God. Who is the most merciful person in the universe? God. You think there's any little connection there? Yes, fools are judgmental. Wise people are merciful. Anytime I start judging you, I'm being foolish. Anytime I'm being merciful, I'm being like God. And that's wise. It's wise to give people the benefit of the doubt. It's wise to show grace, to show mercy, to be forgiving, to cut people some slack. God cuts me slack all the time. So I better cut it to somebody else. Everything you have in life is a sheer gift from God. Your next breath 
is because of the mercy of God. You wouldn't be alive if it weren't for the mercy of God. If it weren't for the grace of God, you wouldn't see, hear, touch, smell, you wouldn't exist. Everything and I have and everything you have is because God is a merciful and gracious God. God doesn't give me what I deserve, he gives me what I need. If I got what I deserve, I wouldn't be standing here. If you got what you deserve, you wouldn't be alive. God doesn't give you what you deserve. He gives you what you need, that's mercy. And the Bible says that's wise. Wise people give people what they need, not what they deserve. That's mercy and that's wisdom. So here's the fifth mark of wisdom in a relationship. If I wanna be wise, my kids, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my husband, my wife, if I wanna be wise, I won't emphasize your mistakes because I am merciful. Wise people don't rub it in. Wise people rub it out. Wise people are merciful. So let me ask you, how high do you rate on mercy? Do you jump on every fault or blunder? You know, great move, klutzo. You know, you're always picking at people, always pointing out their errors and mistakes. Do you continually bring up the past and every little sin that your husband or your wife or your girlfriend or whoever has done, you file it back so you can pull it out when you need to, to get a little leverage? I heard about a high school kid recently came home from school with a bad report card and his dad blew a gasket. And uh, next day he went back to school and, the, and his friend at school said, what did your dad think? He said, oh, my dad got historical. He said, don't you mean hysterical? He said, no, historical. He told me everything I've ever done wrong. <laughs> do you do that? You, you know, you let it all pile up, you let it all damn up, and then when somebody hits you at the wrong spot, you just blah, you let it all out? That is foolish. Because wisdom is full of mercy. It's full of good deeds. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 9, love forgets mistakes. Nagging about them parts the best of friends. Now think of the person who's closest to you in your life. Right now, okay. Think of the person who's closest to you in your life. And even though you love them, there's some things they do that just flat out bug you. I mean, it really bugs you. You know those things that really get you going? Let it go. Let it go. It is foolish to hold on to it. Let it go. There's so many things to love about them. Let it go. You're not God. Last week I saw Mike and Sally Kendall out here on the campus. Mike has been on staff in facilities for many, many years. And I happen to know that Sally and Mike had just had their 50th wedding anniversary. And uh, Mike had kissed Sally and she was getting ready to drive off. And I walked over to Sally's car, she rolled the window down and I said, congratulations Sally on 50 years of marriage. I said, what is the secret of a 50 year lasting marriage? She looked at me, she said, pastor, I never tried to change him. And she drove off and I'm not making this up, this is the exact truth and they had not colluded on this. I walked up to Mike who was further on up the way, and I said, Mike, congratulations on 50 years of, of marriage. I said, what's the secret of 50 years of marriage? He said, I never tried to change her. They had both said the exact same thing. Wisdom is full of mercy. Number six, the Bible says that wisdom is impartial and always sincere. Now this is interesting, these two words in the Greek, in the original Greek in the Bible, are the words adikritos and anipokritos. They're very similar words, impartial and sincere. Adikritos, anipokritos. Um, let me explain it this way. The Greeks invented theater. Comedies, tragedies, you know, all Plato, Socrates, Sophocles, all these guys wrote very famous plays. And in Greek plays, one guy would often be an actor and would play many parts. He'd come out wearing a mask and he'd say his part, then he'd go back behind the stage, he'd get another mask, he'd come back out and he'd play somebody else's part. Then he'd go back behind the stage 
and he'd get another mask and he'd come back out. He's playing many roles and wearing many masks and the word in Greek for that person, he was called a hypocritos. We get the word hypocrite from it. It means he wears a mask. He's always acting a different role. Hypocritos, always playing a role, always wearing a mask. These words are the exact opposite. Adikritos, anipokritos, it means impartial and sincere. It means you're genuine, you're without hypocrisy, you're the real deal. The word we would use today is the word authentic, authentic. Now, here's the sixth key. If I wanna be wise in my relationships, I won't disguise my intentions. I won't wear a mask. I won't fake it. I won't pretend. I won't try to be somebody that I'm not. I won't lie to you, I won't cheat you, I won't trick you, I won't fake you out. I won't take advantage of you, I won't deliberately mislead you. The point is this, fools are fakes. Wise people are authentic. They're the real deal, they aren't phonies, they're genuine, they're authentic, they're warts and all. What you see is what you get. Now, there are two places today where people fake it more than anywhere else, where people are phony. They don't show their true selves more than anywhere else. Two places, online and on dates. <laughs> they don't show their true selves. They're always trying to make themselves look better than they really are online and on dates. Psalm 12, verse two, look up here on it. The Bible says, oh, Proverbs 10, 18. The lips of a liar conceal hostility and whoever spreads accusations is a fool. Let me read you Psalm 12, two. Everyone lies to his neighbor, their flattering lips speak with deception. You know, dating actually sets up relationships to be phony because dating in itself is an artificial relationship you look your best you act your best you talk your best you dress your best shoot you smell your best on a date <laughs> it's not the real you it's passing gas and burping <laughs> you know no no you're just super cool and and you're, you're not really real you, on dates you know no man would ever actually go to the opera except on a date. Okay, ladies, you just need to realize, no man likes opera. Okay, okay, really. In fact, you laugh at things on dates that aren't even funny. It's, you know, somebody says it and you, your date says something, and you go, <laughs> it was the stupidest thing you ever heard, but you laughed at it anyway. Okay, it is a phony, fake relationship. In fact, no place on the planet Earth is more inauthentic, more phony than a singles bar. I mean, it is the epitome of fake, phony, inauthentic relationships. Nowhere else on the planet can a total stranger come up to you and offer to buy you something. Can I buy you a drink? You don't even know me. I mean, were you in Sears, a guy walks up and says, can I give you a toaster? I mean, really, you're in Albertsons. Care for a box of Captain Crunch? <laughs> you're kind of cute, you know. Can I get you some pickles? <laughs> it's so phony, it's so fake. If I'm honest, if I'm real, if I'm wise, I'm not gonna disguise who I really am. Now let's review. How wise are you in your relationships? Do you ever compromise your integrity? That's not wise. Do you antagonize other people's anger and push their buttons intentionally just to get even? Dumb, not wise. Do you minimize feelings? You shouldn't feel that way. Do you criticize suggestions? That's a dumb idea. Do you emphasize mistakes and you rub it in rather than out? Do you disguise your attention? Friends, as your pastor who loves you, if you don't wise up, if you don't wise up, if you don't learn some godly wisdom, you're gonna go through your entire life making the same relational mistakes over and over and over and over, and you're not gonna get what you want out of that relationship. A intimate, 
satisfying, soul-satisfying relationship, the kind that God intended for you to have. How do I get the wisdom to stop making foolish mistakes in relationships? Well, there's only two places you get wisdom. You don't get it from college. You don't get it from online uh, you know, blogs. You don't get it from TV shows. You get wisdom from knowing God and doing what he says to do, doing his word, knowing God and doing his word. You can get intelligence, you can get facts, you can get information, you can get smarts, you can get technical skills from going to school. But you don't get wisdom from going to school. You get wisdom from knowing God and doing what he says to do because he is the source of all wisdom. Now, this book, the Bible, this is filled with relational wisdom for you. And, and if you'll stick with me for the next six weeks, we're gonna, we're gonna help revolutionize your relationships. And my goal for this series is that you'll learn what God says to do and then you'll do it. And the emphasis is on doing it. You know, this week I got a call um, from Manny Pacquiao. Manny Pacquiao is the world's greatest boxer. Pound for pound, the strongest boxer ever the only man to win the world championship in eight different weight classes. He's voted boxer of the decade. He's a Filipino, he's a congressman in the Philippines. And he read The Purpose Driven Life and gave his life to Christ. And he told me, Rick, I, I cried all the way through it the first time I read through it. He says, I, I give it to everybody. And uh, I was invited up to go up and, and do a Bible study. His biggest fight is coming up in about a week. And, he said, come on up and, and, and do a Bible study. And, you know, Manny grew up in, in a poor family of six kids, and at 14 his mom couldn't afford to keep him at home, so she kicked him out, and he grew up on the streets of Manila. But he has filled his mind with the Word of God, and he has grown in the Word of God. And after we did this Bible study, I just interviewed him on it. It's a long interview, but I'm just going to play about a minute. Watch this clip. Well, we're here with a break uh, after training with Manny Pacquiao and his wife, Chinky. And uh, Manny, we've been doing a couple Bible studies right here at the table. Uh, this guy's a, a, a Bible uh, quoting maniac. He, uh, he quoted probably 50 different verses to me in the time we were talking. How important is the Word of God to you? We, we have a lot of um, uh, trials, um, troubles, problems before yeah. in the past. Yeah. But um, we survive because of the words of God we put in, in the center. We're not only uh, believing, praying, uh -huh. it's not enough. James 2 verse 19 and 20, it says, You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that in shudder. Yeah, so and in 20, yeah. you foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? I mean, deeds is in action, action you have to, 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 to follow. In Luke uh, 6 verse 46, it says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do what I say? It's action again. It's action again. And in Matthew 7, verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So, but only the one who does, is action does. So it's all in action. You have to do it. We believe and pray, and we have to apply in ourselves. It's not enough just to hear the Word of God. Exactly. You have to do it. Exactly. You have to apply it. You have to act on it. You have exactly. to practice exactly. it. Uh, you didn't become uh, the greatest boxer of your time without applying and, exactly. applying and, exactly. and, and practicing mm -hmm. and, and training. So talk about training for a minute. I have the fight on June 9th. I believe 100% that, that I'm going to win. Mm -hmm. I have faith that I'm going to win. Mm -hmm. But how can I win if I don't train? I don't have deeds. Sure, you, st you have to have the deeds. Yes, deeds, you yeah, deeds. deeds. action, you have, I have to work. Action. I have to work, so same thing in the words of God. When you hear the words of God, you have to apply it in yourself. So you have deeds. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. God Thank bless you. you. Thank now Manny told me, he said, as an athlete, I have a training table that I eat very specific things four times a day. And he said, I got to thinking that if I had to eat four times a day for physical strength, I needed to be eating spiritually four times a day for spiritual strength. So he says, I study the Bible four times a day. Just like I eat four times a day to build spiritual strength. 
Now here at Saddleback, we're always trying to develop tools to help you get into the Word of God so you won't be a wimpy Christian, so you'll be a strong one. And I'm excited to announce two things today. One, starting this weekend, we're offering a video curriculum, small group video curriculum, based on each week's message. So the message that I just taught you just now, this afternoon, it will be available in a small group curriculum that your small group can study it and discuss what we just talked about this week during your small group. So I hope all of our small groups, all 6,000 of them, will go through the You Make Me Crazy series. They're gonna be available Sunday afternoon every week uh, with the questions and video that you can watch uh, to, to, to go deeper in what we've been talking about today. Second thing, in September, we're going to unveil the Saddleback phone and tablet app, which is a Bible study app. You can see it on the screen, Church Notes app. The notes that you take every week, starting in September, you'll be able to take them on your phone or on a tablet. You will be able to make notes on that, keep notes, send notes to other small group members, watch the video on your phone or on that uh, tablet, uh, pass it on, study it with people, and share it with other people. That's gonna come out in September. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, that's pretty cool, that'll be available. But you're not gonna know the Word of God until you know the Lord of God. Two verses, look up here on the screen. Psalm 111, verse 10. Respect for the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You want wisdom in your relationship? You gotta start with the relationship to the Lord. And the Bible says in Colossians chapter two, Jesus is the key that opens all the hidden treasures of God's wisdom and knowledge. You gotta get to know Jesus. I got a letter a while back where a guy told me, he said, Rick, all my relationships constantly fell apart until I met Jesus and I began to learn the wisdom he gave me. Have you met Jesus? Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your word, that you want us to be wise, not foolish in our relationships. And I pray that even today, everyone here will make a commitment to be with us for these six weeks as we talk about how to strengthen our good relationships, how to heal our bad ones, how to deal with the crazy makers in our lives. But Lord, today we start with us. Why don't you pray this prayer? Dear Jesus, help me to not compromise my integrity. Help me not to antagonize people's anger. Help me not to minimize people's feelings. Help me not to criticize people's suggestions or emphasize their mistakes. Help me not to disguise who I really am. Help me to be authentic and real and genuine. Say, God, I need your wisdom. I want to know you, Jesus Christ, and I want to do your word. If you've never invited Christ in your life, say, Jesus Christ, come into my heart and life right now and take control of my life. I want to learn to trust you and love you. In your name I pray.